The Prince of Wales jokes with a group of young people in an out-of-season holiday camp. This is the Haven Camp in Kaystrom Sea, Norfolk, in March this year. The young people are all unemployed. There are over 400 staying here on a week-long course organised by the Prince's Trust to restore their confidence. Oh. Right, Dean, one of the points I want to and to develop their job hunting skills. Very well indeed, was maintaining good eye contact with me. Yeah. The Prince has come here on a flying visit to meet some of the young people and to boost their morale. But I just pray that this sort of experience and the sort of encouragement you may have received will enable you to face very often what may be a difficult future with a bit more confidence and a bit more hope. And all I can say is, look after yourselves and the very best of luck. The contrast between the position of the prince and that of the youngsters he is addressing could not be more stark. And it goes to the heart of a central problem for the monarchy today. What sort of relationship should it, the embodiment of class, have to a society which is supposedly becoming increasingly classless? On the one hand, the monarchy stands for national unity above all class divisions and vested interests. On the other, the monarchy is the supreme embodiment of privilege, of inherited wealth, of hierarchy and of inequality. And it's resolving that paradox that is one of the fundamental problems of the modern monarchy. The monarchy itself has long been aware of this problem and Prince Charles is not the first member of his family to attempt to bridge the gap between crown and people. Before the war, conscious that society was becoming more democratic, his grandfather, George VI, set up the Duke of York camps. For the 14th year out of 15, His Royal Highness the Duke of York spends a night at his camp, where under the industrial welfare movement, 400 boys from the public schools and industrial centres are spending their holiday together in the comradeship of the open air. One of those who attended the camp in 1936 was Ron Hopcroft, then an apprentice with the Gaslight and Coke Company. And here we are suddenly mixing with boys from the colleges who are going to be our future bosses or masters and uh, actually talking and mixing and playing with them. And there's not much doubt that a better understanding between the two sections of society, shall we say, was achieved. The camps even had their own theme song. The Duke of York enjoyed taking part in the sing-songs, although he didn't share all aspects of camp life. Yes, in the centre of the layout of the camp, there were two semi-marquees which were never used, and when the Duke of York came on the Wednesday, we suddenly realised that they were for him, you see, and, of course, when he went on the Thursday afternoon, we sneaked out later on, ducked our heads under the camp to have a look in them, and much to our surprise, there was a four-poster bed with a canopy over the top of it with all the other wash and basin and uh, wardrobe etc etc one would expect in a hotel and it made us chuckle really when we then read in the paper next day that he enjoyed all the hardships of us other campers out there before the war few people voiced criticisms of the monarchy but by the time George VI's daughter Elizabeth came to the throne British society had changed dramatically. Refrigerators, cookers and cupboards are all in the latest fashion, clean and... And an increasing desire for greater social equality left the monarchy looking distinctly out of step. This turned into a huge public issue in 1957. John Edward Poynter Griggs, 2nd Baron Autringham, is in hot water. This 33-year-old peer often expresses views unpopular with his fellow Tories. But now he is under fire from inside and outside his own party. In an article in his journal, The National and English Review, he voices criticisms of the Queen and her court, which roused the wrath of much of the national press. Grigg complained in his article that the Queen was isolated from her subjects and out of touch with contemporary Britain, largely because she was surrounded by people who came exclusively from the upper classes. The trouble about the court is that it's all drawn from one small section of this country. It should be drawn from every country of the Commonwealth and from every section of the community. 
Grigg didn't mince his words. He described the Queen's speaking manner as a pain in the neck and said her speeches conveyed the personality of a priggish schoolgirl. I name this ship Empress of Britain. May God speed her and all who sail in her. <laughs> Grigg's remarks aroused such hostility that he was even attacked in the street by an irate monarchist. And I that the Queen was thought to be out of touch with the mainstream of British society was hardly surprising. She and her sister Margaret never went to school because their father couldn't conceive of them mixing with ordinary children. So we find the Princess Elizabeth and her sister Margaret, accompanied by their governesses, enjoying a short trip upriver starting from Bolter's Lock. It was not until she was 18 and allowed to join the volunteer army that the Queen had any contact with contemporaries who were not of her class. When the war ended a few weeks later, she and Margaret had a rare experience of rubbing shoulders with ordinary people on the evening of VE Day. My sister and I realised we couldn't see what the crowds were enjoying, so we asked my parents if we could go out and see for ourselves. I remember we were terrified of being recognised. So I pulled my uniform cap well down over my eyes. We cheered the king and queen on the balcony and then walked miles through the streets. I think it was one of the most memorable nights of my life. But this was only a brief encounter with the outside world. By the 1950s, the queen had returned to a life which was almost totally separate from that of her subjects. But Grigg's criticisms proved to be a turning point. One very leading member of the royal household uh, uh, arranged that we should meet within 48 hours of the thing starting, great row of starting. Um, and uh, his first words to me when we met were, this is the best thing that's happened to Buckingham Palace in my time. I mean, we were both strong monarchists and we both felt that change was needed. Not um, excessive change, but, but significant change. <laughs> To begin with, the monarchy set about changing some of the social events which associated it with privilege and wealth. The practice of presenting debutantes to the Queen, upper-class young girls coming out into society for the first time, was abruptly terminated. And it was also decided to make the traditional garden parties more democratic affairs. In future, a far wider cross-section of society would be invited. Today, three garden parties are held at Buckingham Palace every summer, and over 8,000 people attend each one. Some of them will have been specially selected to meet the Queen. And there's always a chance of a chat with other members of the royal family too. Whilst it may not be a very close encounter with royalty, there's no doubt that garden party invitations are highly appreciated. Well, I think it's an honour, you know, to, to go to the palace in the first place. And the dress and the, the hats and the people, it was just wonderful. I actually wondered what, what it was like to be stared at by all the peasants, you know. <laughs> in order to try and gain a greater insight into the lives of her subjects than the garden parties allow, the Queen has also introduced the practice of holding informal lunches. Joy Pinder, head teacher of Starbank Primary School in Birmingham, is one of those who have been invited to lunch at the palace. The Queen walked through the door, preceded by her corgis, and we were formally introduced. She went down the line that had gathered, and the Duke followed her. Once he had passed, I began to relax, but almost immediately the Queen was walking back to speak to P.D. James and I, who P.D. James was another guest on that occasion. What does that mean? We talked about teaching children to write, and the Queen wanted to know whether children were still asked to write with their right hand. And when I said they weren't, she said how pleased she was about that, because her father had been left-handed and made to write with his right hand, and she did feel that um, being forced to do so had added to his um, stammer, which was a nervous thing. She also um, talked about child-rearing practices generally, and um, while we were talking, one of the corgis came and nipped her heels, and uh, she 
quickly looked round and said, did you see that? Did you see what you did? Talk about biting the hand that feeds you. But perhaps the most radical innovation of all has been the walkabout, introduced by the Queen in 1970. For the first time ever, unselected members of the public could meet the monarch if they chose to. Gwyn Fitch was in Derby in May. Well, today I've uh, found out that the Queen's <coughs> going to walk from the recreation uh, centre by coming down a ramp, and uh, it's said that she will do a walkabout. So hopefully, um, with all the flowers that are along these barriers, and my flowers, she'll walk over. And I've also managed uh, to bring with me this time um, a photograph I took last year of Sandringham Gardens, so I'm just hoping um, that I'll get that opportunity to, to hand them to her and tell her about my visit. The far greater accessibility of the monarchy in recent times can be seen from surveys, which show that one in 12 people have met a member of the royal family, many of them on walkabouts like this one. Your Majesty. Yeah. Hello, Your Majesty. I'm trying to make music. Make them. Uh, yeah. I wonder if you would accept this picture. I took it of, you, of your gardens in Sandringham about a year ago, oh. and I thought, well, you very rarely have the chance to see Sandringham. Well, I hardly ever see it in the summertime. I know, anyway. that's what I thought. And uh, some flowers. It's Thank lovely you. to see that's you. Really Wonderful to see you. Oh, that's really Thank you very much. Your Majesty, delighted to see you. It's wonderful. She's our monarch. And um, for her to take her time to speak to me, it's wonderful. <laughs> I can't believe it. I made it. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Knight's Bachelor, four, one, two, three, four. One of the monarchy's most important one, formal CEO. roles in British society is the handing out of honours. Historically, the sovereign granted all the honours. Today, the vast majority are decided not by the Queen, but by the Prime Minister. Twelve. 16, 20, 20. However, the Queen remains the symbolic fount of all honour, and some of the orders, including that of the Garter, are still in her personal gift. The highest honours in the country, uh, the Order of Merit, uh, the Garter, uh, the Thistle, the Orders of Chivalry, those are awarded uh, by the Queen, and she has a pervasive influence uh, throughout uh, that whole world of honours reward. Ken Toon, the retired miners leader from Derbyshire, was at the palace in May to receive an MBE for his services to the coal mining industry. Recipients of the lower orders wait while the country's future knights receive their instruction. Some, the stool will be there. If you are to receive the accolade, the way that I recommend you go down, stop behind it as I am here, take the handrail in your right hand, your left foot on the left side, and just go down on the right knee. So you stop. And it's one, two, three. Very nice and easy and quite comfortable. At last, Whilst it's the turn of the MBEs. The Lord Chamberlain will read out your name. Please, without labouring the point, would you listen for it? And would you act on it? And using your surname as the cue, continue along the red carpet until you're nice and central in front of the Queen. Stop. Turn to face her. Ladies, a little curtsy. Gentlemen, a head bow. Nothing too theatrical. And then move straight away forward the four or five paces that separate you from the dais. Stunned silence. <laughs> is there any kneeling? You're not going to kneel, sir. Yeah. No, there is some kneeling, but it's all them in there. No. <laughs> not this time. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kenneth Toon. Mr. Kenneth Toon for services to the mining community in South Derbyshire. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for any person to be awarded an honour and come and be presented by the Queen and look inside the palace itself. That in itself must be marvellous. It's been a wonderful experience with a wonderful day and it will rest in our minds for a very, very long time.
14 investitures are held every year, and over 2,000 people annually receive decorations. But who gets what? And the honours system reflects the class system, basically. It reinforces the class system. If, for example, uh, you're a, a politician on the Conservative backbenches who's had 15 undistinguished years, you'll get uh, a knighthood. Uh, if you're a, a busy sister in a, an inner-city hospital, you probably won't get an award at all, or if you do, it'll be an award at the bottom rank of the honours system. But criticisms of the honours system on the grounds of class are nothing new and the Order of the British Empire was introduced by King George V in 1917 specifically to make the honour system more democratic. This was a wartime measure to recognise the war effort of every class of society. Before 1917, honours had been almost exclusively aristocratic. And then suddenly you got the Order of the British Empire uh, with its five classes and a medal as well. And now this has grown to something like 250,000 recipients. If you agree there should be an honest system at all, then I think it's excellent that it shouldn't be confined just to the aristocracy. The lowest rank of the OBE is the BEM, the British Empire Medal. And the, the, the description of the BEM really says all we need to know about the honours system. It, it actually says that the BEM is for those people who, by rank, don't qualify for a higher award. What an absurd thing to say, that uh, we're giving you an honour, but I'm afraid your rank in society doesn't qualify you for anything higher. But the honour system itself is only a reflection, critics argue, of the class structure in society which they believe is underpinned by the very existence of the monarchy. The effect of having uh, a monarchy or a crown presiding over our society is to make us very hierarchical. Everybody's got their place. God bless the squire and his relations and keep us in our proper stations. If you're a plain mister, there's a gentleman above you and a squire. Above an esquire is a knight, above a knight is a baronet, above a baronet is a baron, above a baron is a viscount, above a viscount is an earl, above an earl is a marquis, above a marquis is a duke, above a duke is a royal duke, and then a royal duke bows and scrapes to the crown. So it is a hierarchical society. And while the public face of the monarchy has changed, inside the royal household itself still exist the social distinctions of another era. If Queen Victoria came back today, she would see that basically the court is essentially the same as it was in her day. The faces have changed, but the names remain the same. It's all the various earls of Westmoreland and Northumberland and Dukes of Norfolk and so on. So the composition is very much what it's always been. The same aristocratic families have served as courtiers for centuries. One of these is the Earleys. The Earl of Earley is Lord Chamberlain, the head of the royal household. His wife, Virginia, is a lady of the bedchamber. His father, the 12th Earl, was Lord Chamberlain to the Queen Mother for nearly three decades. And his grandmother, the Countess of Airlie, spent 50 years as lady-in-waiting to Queen Mary. The professional staff in the palace also tend to be drawn almost exclusively from the upper classes. The yes. professional staff who basically run the monarchy are, are recruited from a fairly narrow social band and it's really by word of mouth. The royal household are the oldest old boys network in the world. You have to be invited to join by the Queen and it's interesting that it's basically friends of a friend. Um, Sir Robert Fellows, who's presently the Queen's private secretary, is the brother-in-law to uh, the Princess of Wales, also related to the Duchess of York, and his father was the land agent to the Queen. So it's all very tightly linked. But not everyone who works for the royals is part of this inner circle. There's a strict hierarchy within the palace which operates its very own class system. We've definitely got a, a class distinction within the households of the royal family. At the very top, you could call it the aristocracy, if you like, of the royal household. That is, the members. Then you've got a sort of a middle-class area, which may well be described, or is, the officials. And then, of course, you've got the downstairs area, the working class, if you like, which is called the staff. The three classes are completely separate. They do not socialise in any way. They don't eat together. The lower orders have to address the upper ones as sir or madam. The whole thing is very, very class-based, very much like it was in Victorian times. 
but those familiar with court circles say the Queen is oblivious to all such class distinctions. I remember once talking to a particularly grand duke about this subject, and he said, what you must remember is that I may be a duke and you may not be a duke, but in the eyes of the Queen, we are both subjects. And I may be a slightly grander subject than you are, but that makes very, very little difference indeed in the eyes of the Queen. We're all servants. But even between members of the royal family themselves, elaborate formalities are observed according to their respective stations. Some years ago, when I was a butler to the, to the very pleasant Duke and Duchess of Kent, uh, we had a dinner just for Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden. And it went on rather late, till three o'clock in the morning, and I was summoned to bring the car up and all the rest of it. And when they arrived in the hall to say good night to each other, there was the Duchess of Kent curtsying to Princess Margaret. There was Lord Snowden bowing his head to say good night to the Duke of Kent, all at three o'clock in the morning. And it was only me there. It really wasn't quite necessary. But there again, that was a training for them within their own family. And these formalities continue today. When Prince Edward wants to go see his father, you'll have to make an appointment through his valet. And when they meet together, they will, he will perform a, a neck bow to him. Similarly with Prince Charles, when he wants to go see the Queen, he'll have to make an appointment, and he always bows when, when he meets her. This is a very formal world, and as Princess uh, Diana found when she was courting Prince Charles, she had to call him Sir throughout their romance, and even after the engagement, she had to ask formally to be able to call him by his first name. It is this strict adherence to hierarchy and its remoteness from ordinary life that has been blamed for the royal family's apparent inability to absorb commoners. If you look at that family, it is obviously a very difficult family to marry into. Lord Snowden, Mark Phillips, Fergie, and as far as can, we can see, Diana, all those marriages have come to grief. Why is it? It becomes increasingly clear that the House of Windsor treats the people who marry into it, who are not born royal, or in Margaret Thatcher's favorite phrase, one of us, it treats them as second-class citizens. And it's no wonder that the marriages come to grief. But while in many respects it might be good for the monarchy to become less distant and more ordinary, some of the Queen's subjects would not welcome such a change. If one is going to have a royal family, it's got to be different. There's no point in having a royal family which is not different. If they're going to be different, then they must to some extent stay remote and mysterious and leave you wondering a bit always what is going on behind those palace walls. And given that, I don't think that they can or should come down too far from their pedestal, mix too much with the masses. Nevertheless, during the Queen's reign, British society has changed, and it's argued that the monarchy must reflect this, both for its own sake and for the good of the country as a whole. The main importance of the monarchy today is as a symbol, so it's crucial we should get that symbolism right. The chief problem of the monarchy is that it still embodies the privileged society we once were, rather than the classless society we now aspire to be. The question of royal privilege has focused in particular on the size of the Queen's fortune and on the cost of the monarchy as a whole. In next week's programme, we examine the royal finances. <laughs>